who use that term muscle protein synthesis, and it's going to be really important moving forward. So let's get into what that means. So every day, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, the body has to build something over 250 grams of new protein. And so we call that process of building it protein synthesis. So the body is taking all of these amino acids. We have 20 amino acids that make up protein. And the body assembles those into different proteins. That's the process of protein synthesis. Um, and the other half of that process is protein breakdown. So every day we're breaking down about 250 to 300 grams. So that's a cycle that we're trying to maintain. And the better we maintain it, uh, if we can keep synthesis and degradation or breakdown the same, then we can keep our muscle mass constant. In general, aging means that breakdown's a little bit higher than synthesis, so we have a slow loss. So it's a it's a the total process is called protein turnover and consists of the process of making protein, protein synthesis, and breakdown, breaking it down. So that's the those are the processes. We think that synthesis is the more important. We think the body regulates everything on the synthesis side because it's much more uh, energetically expensive. Uh, the body doesn't build protein unless everything's kind of right. Uh, breakdown kind of goes on no matter what we do. And by the sounds of it, there's breakdown that's naturally happening in the body no matter what, even for the sedentary person. And then I'd assume that gets ramped up when somebody starts doing resistance training. Yes, I would go with that. So the, you know, the amount of breakdown, the exact amount um, per day, I'm not sure we've got a really good numbers to put on that. So I keep using this 250 to 300 grams per day. Uh, I can't tell you that, you know, if I'm doing a lot of resistance exercise, uh, it becomes 350. Um, we do know that exhaustive exercise does increase the degradation time. We do know that the body becomes more catabolic. But to put an actual number on it, uh, I've never seen anybody attempt to do that. But uh, in general, I agree that, you know, it's more during the exercise period, if it's intense, uh, it's more catabolic. But if you're just going out and saying, you know, I'm walking five blocks, that's not going to be a catabolic experience. And, and people who become well-trained, uh, the exercise bout is less catabolic. So it's most catabolic in an untrained people, person who does an exhaustive exercise. The more trained you are, the less catabolic it becomes. Okay, to put that a different way then, say we have an untrained person, they do some heavy resistance training, does muscle protein synthesis become more important than the person who's on a day off, somebody who's regularly working out, but they're on a day off? Does it become more important in that earlier case? Um, it's, it's important in both cases. What's different uh, is in the untrained person, what we've shown is that protein soon after that exercise is important for recovery. If the more trained you are, the less important it is to have it right afterwards. We showed that uh, if you're untrained and you do an exhaustive bout of exercise, you become quite catabolic. And the sooner you go into a recovery, uh, you can get back into, you know, stop losing muscle mass. Uh, you can recover from it. So uh, that untrained person there's a lot of the research that's out there is studying that untrained person because you can get bigger effects. Uh, if you're well-trained, um, I'm not sure that protein immediately after exercise is particularly important. You go to the gym and you'll see the weightlifters carrying around bottles and drinking protein shakes and things. I, I, I hope it makes them feel better, but I'm not sure they're getting any real benefit versus just eating their next meal as high protein. It's important we get into this because this is one of the things in the resistance training world where people are, yeah, walking around the gym with their protein shakes and drinking it in between sets and after workouts. So just to make sure we're hundred percent clear on this, then for somebody who is untrained and maybe just beginning at the gym, that could be valuable to do that. But for somebody who has been training for years and they're fit and they're just maintaining, maybe putting on a little bit of muscle, it would be enough for them just to leave things alone after the workout and go into their next meal and get their protein through that. 
But the nuance I want to get into, what if what if it's like five hours? Just how long how long of a period would they have even for the trained person before that would make a difference? I would hope after most people exercise, they're hungry before five hours. But, you know, to some extent, to some extent, you're right. Um, you know, I think in a well-trained individual, uh, once they sort of define their meals, they should see, keep that with regularity. You know, and so if you have meals every, you know, five hours, you know, whatever, seven, 12, seven, whatever, five, six hours, um, where are you going to put the exercise that's not within four hours of, of a meal? <laughs> you know, <laughs> where are you going to do it? <laughs> uh, you know, I, I just think it's not that important. Uh, if people who are actually trying to gain muscle mass, they will often try to increase their total protein. So we talked about a range, but a lot of those kind of people will go up to, uh, you know, a gram per pound or maybe even higher. Uh, then the question is, what's the efficiency of a meal? We know there's a, a beneficial range of a meal of about 30 to 55 grams of protein. Uh, if you get above that, the body doesn't really use it very well. It becomes less efficient. And so now if you're trying to get in 200 grams of protein, say you're six, you know, you're six foot five and you weigh 285, how, where would you put it? Okay, now there's a reason to have a fourth meal. If you want to have a protein shake after your workout, that's great. If you want to do it later at night, that's great. But you know, having more meals becomes a good choice. And after exercise is fine, but there's no magic to that. I want to come back to frequency of eating and dosage of protein, but I think it'd be helpful first to come come back and zoom back on this muscle protein synthesis thing. And I know a starting place for people when they come to this protein world that you like to recommend is to get that protein bolus first thing in the morning of that 30 to 55 grams of protein to stimulate muscle protein synthesis. So let's start there and talk about why that's important. And then we can get into some of these other nuances. So we've been talking about aging and I was talking about weight loss. And so it's it's important to think about the effects of meals and also the nighttime fasting. So what we know is that the anabolic period of a meal for muscle protein synthesis is about two hours. So if you have a protein meal at seven at night, you're anabolic from seven to nine, and then you go into a catabolic period for the next 22 hours. So in that overnight period, you're breaking down muscle basically to fuel other organs. The liver in the middle of the night, I mean, a lot of the amino, a lot of the proteins in the liver only last an hour or two. They're constantly being replaced. Proteins in the blood are constantly being replaced. Uh, red blood cells. Your brain cells, everything is constantly turning over, even in the middle of the night. So where do they get all the amino acids to do this? Well, the only, there's unlike body fat, which is a storage for energy, there's no storage for amino acids. So it comes from muscle. So during these nighttime periods, we're very catabolic. The muscle's breaking down, supplying amino acids so the liver can keep making protein. If the liver can't make protein in the middle of the night, you die. So it has to get it some, someplace. And so you wake up in the morning after now you've had a 12 or more hour fast, you're totally catabolic. You're breaking down muscle protein and you're going to stay that way until you eat protein and until you eat enough to stimulate muscle protein synthesis. So that's kind of how we got into it. We were studying that and we basically discovered that it takes um, a certain amount of protein, that certain amounts around 30 grams of protein, 35 grams. And it's because of a certain amino acid called leucine, which we kind of discovered its role. Um, we can get into that, whatever level you want. But basically, we want to get people out of that catabolic condition as soon as possible, get them back into making pr protein, replacing their muscle protein. And, and again, we think that in aging, 
or in weight loss, any stress condition, that that becomes even more critical. So if you know I have an average 25-year-old who's healthy and active and eating a lot of food, chances are it's not that big of a deal. But we think the older you get, the less efficient you are, the more stress you're under, the more and more important it gets. A lot I want to get into you opened up there, starting with the fact that when we take in protein, we don't have storage for it. So we only have it in the system for a couple of hours, and then we start pulling from muscle. Really important point for us to highlight. And where that ties in as you were talking there, when we wake up, a common practice in the health and wellness space is intermittent fasting and not taking any calories in until say lunch or some people are pushing it even further and having one meal a day or even doing longer fast multiple days. So I'm really curious on how, how you think about fasting and if it's ever beneficial or because of what we just talked about, we should be avoiding it. Yeah, um, lots of pieces. Uh, I had a couple of other thoughts come in, so now I'm thinking about too many things. But uh, um, so again, how you answer that question depends a little on the stress you're under. Um, so you know, if again you're pretty healthy, your muscle mass, you're pretty active, and you want to do a time restricted feeding, uh, I usually use the term first meal as opposed to breakfast. And so whether that first meal is at seven in the morning or 1130, it's still the first meal. And whatever that first meal is needs to be high protein. Okay, so that kind of addresses time restricted eating. Um, the more stress you're under, if you're trying to lose weight, if you're, you know, 65 or 70, and you're, you know, stressed, you know, more likely to be uh, losing muscle mass, you're weaker. I think moving it to an, you know as soon as possible in the morning becomes more and more important. I practice sort of a slightly different form of it. The purpose of intermittent intermittent fasting is to control calories. There's no magic about it. It's a way of controlling calories. Condense your eating into two meals, and people seem to eat less. Okay. But you get the same effect if you just control the calories and you eat three meals a day. Uh, there's no magic to re time restricted feeding. It's just a calorie thing. So another approach to be at, that I actually practice is I tend to have my protein fairly early in the day. So I blunt that overnight effect and I basically skip the noon meal. I don't eat in the middle of the day and then I eat again late. So I'm not restricting my time, but I'm restricting my meals. So two meals close together or two meals far apart, it's still two meals. The only thing I'd push back on there is when it comes to intermittent fasting, having that eating window narrowed and keeping things, say, within a six-hour window, you're going to keep blood glucose down in the morning, keep insulin down, and keep into fat burning rather than spiking insulin, blood glucose, having even a high protein meal in the morning, and then you start that blood sugar roller coaster, even if you're eating a healthy I, diet. I, 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 I totally disagree with that. Okay, and we've, talk about we've it. Published, and we've published that. So by lowering blood carbohydrates in the morning, you can avoid the insulin. But if you do what I said and get the carbohydrates protein into a one-to-one -to -one ratio, you won't see that. So the the satiety effects, the, the blood roller coaster effect of a high carb, low protein diet, you will mitigate that just by getting the carbs down. So we usually put a limit of carbohydrates on that breakfast meal of about 30 grams. And we will, we basically will correct metabolic syndrome. We'll take away those swings just by getting it down. So intermittent fasting may be a way of controlling it. But if you still end up with a high carb meal at dinner, you're still going to have the same problems. If you still have a high carb, low protein diet, even though you do intermittent fasting, you're still going to have the same problems. Okay. But what if we have somebody that is watching their carbs and still maintaining a, a narrow eating window? So they're eating, say, a similar Again, diet to you, but they're nearing the window. Yeah. I just want to push back I, because this I is the common, I, the common word on the street yeah. within the health and wellness the, space, the people I talk yeah. to. The research, the research doesn't back that. The research doesn't back 
that narrowing the window is better than just uh, correcting the macronutrients. If you correct the macronutrient balance, your eating pattern, I don't, I don't know of any data that says that's better. We've done, we've done the experiment with three meals a day, uh, repeatedly. And our data, uh, basically reflects the same, car- uh, glycemic control as you get with a keto diet or time restricted feeding. So I think they all work as an approach and people can choose it. But arguing that one approach is better than the other, the data doesn't back that. No, and that's why this is important. We hash it out because a lot of people are thinking what I'm talking about. So hearing a different perspective and and you're somebody that is knee deep in the science. So yeah, I'm not saying that that approach doesn't work, but I'm saying that you can do it in other ways that are just as effective, and you know, it, it may suit your lifestyle better. I feel better having an early meal. Um, and you know, I get the same effects. All right, let's get into what that early meal looks like. You've touched on the fact that it needs to be 30 grams of protein. Leucine is a factor. So let's talk about whenever that meal is, why those, those both matter. And then we'll get into the leucine piece and how much of that needs to be part of that 30 grams. So the 30 grams really comes from the leucine issue. Um, so, so basically what we discovered was the unique role of the essential amino acid known as leucine to stimulate muscle protein synthesis. It's kind of a dietary marker of a meal quality. Uh, and so what we know is that the, the average U.S. American has about 65% of their protein comes from animal proteins and 35 from plant proteins. And with that mix, a 30 gram protein meal will have about two and a half grams of leucine in it. So the 30 comes from a leucine number. And we know that we need about 2.5 as the minimum, three grams per, uh, uh, three grams may be better uh, of leucine to stimulate and maximize muscle protein synthesis. It's a triggering mechanism. So that's where the 30 comes from. Um, if it's since it's based on leucine, then the protein quality matters. If you're talking about a protein shake that's a whey shake uh, in the morning, 23 grams of protein is enough. If you're talking about a protein shake in the morning that is soy, it takes 33 to be a pure protein. If you're talking about a mixed meal, uh, you know, eggs and meats and breads and things, uh, probably ought to be 35 or more just to be sure you get it. Uh, and we know that while this 30 grams, so, and then there's two parts. So leucine, and we can get into the mechanism, is a triggering mechanism. It's a signal to trigger. And as soon as you trigger the mechanism, then you need all the amino acids. You need all 20. Okay, so then all the rest of the protein. We know that that meal, uh, the minimum level is around 30, and you can still get benefit up to about 55 grams at the meal. When you get above that, it just seems like the muscle can't really handle more than that. It's just too much at a time. Um, people will say, well, you can't absorb more than 30 grams. Well, that's nonsense. You can absorb whatever you eat. So you can have a meal of 100 grams of protein, but it's very inefficient. The body just won't handle it very well. So what do I personally do? My breakfast uh, four or five days a week is a protein shake with about 45 grams of protein in it. And the other days when I'm more willing to cook, I'll do eggs and meats and cheeses and things like that. But, you know, when I'm when I'm time restricted, I do a protein shake. Okay, a lot of detail there. And and that's all very important. But I want to make sure I get into some of the nuance to fully understand. So leucine is at the root of this. And the number is two and a half or three grams we need to to initiate muscle protein synthesis. Depending on the source of the protein, we might not need the full 30. I think you said whey, it was around 23. But you also said the fact that we need the 20 amino acids after we initiate anyways. So it sounds like there's no real shortcutting this by isolating leucine in a supplement 
and just taking that with a regular quote unquote breakfast. And the re- again, the reality is we don't really have the research to exactly define that. So let me let me give you another scenario. Uh, one of the things we've studied since leucine is a trigger, and we know we can stimulate protein synthesis with just leucine, that, but it immediately, it runs for a little while, but then it will slow down or stop because you don't have the other amino acids. So then the question is, how many others do you need? Uh, we know that if you have a 15-gram protein meal and give leucine to get up to 3 grams, you'll get a very robust muscle protein synthesis. Is that different than giving 55 grams? Probably, but we don't honestly know that. Okay. Right? We know that protein synthesis will be a little higher with 45 than it is with 15, uh, but we don't really know the outcome. You know, if you go out, you know, if you go out four months and say, I'm doing this, what difference will we get? We don't know that. We can only know the short-term effects on protein synthesis. If you enjoyed that clip, press here for the full episode. I'll see you over there. It's all about balance and ratios. And so again, you can do it. And there's vegetarians and vegans out there who are very skilled at it, but the average consumer has no clue.